This representation theory talk will be about Frobenius groups. So what I'm going to do is first recall the definition of a Frobenius group and then prove a basic theorem of Frobenius about these groups, about the existence of the so-called Frobenius kernel. So a Frobenius group G is just a transitive permutation group on some finite set um, so that any element fixing two points is the identity. Um, we also add an extra condition that the subgroup fixing a point is not the trivial subgroup because otherwise any group would be a Frobenius group just acting on itself by left translation. So here are some basic examples. We could just take G to be the symmetric group S3 acting on three points and you see if any element fixes two of these points it obviously fixes the third so that it's the the identity. Another one might be G might be the dihedral group on 4n plus 2 points. So here we might have the group of automorphisms of a pentagon and you see if you fix any two vertices of the pentagon then the entire pentagon is fixed so that the dihedral group on 4n plus 2 points is, is, is a Frobenius group. If you look at the dihedral group on 4n points such as say the symmetries of an octagon this isn't a Frobenius group because um, if you take two opposite points, there's a non-trivial automorphism fixing those. So, so that's not a Frobenius group. Another example might be the so-called um, AX plus B group. Here we take A to be in some finite field, say Z modulo PZ, and uh, A to be a non-zero element of this field, and B would be an element of this finite field and the group of all um, automorphisms of the affine line taking x to ax plus b is then a, you can check it's a Frobenius group. So, so Frobenius groups are fairly common. Um, um, if h is the subgroup fixing a point, then Frobenius groups have the following property that g h g to the minus 1 intersection h is just the identity if G is not in the subgroup H. Um, that's because anything in these two subgroups actually fixes two points because it fixes the point um, fixed by H and it also fixes the conjugate of that point by G. So this is more or less another way of defining a Frobenius group. So from this we can get a sort of picture of what a Frobenius group looks like. You imagine all the elements of G sitting inside some set like this and then we might have a subgroup H and inside H is the identity element and H has all these conjugates. So this might be G H G to the minus one and this might be some other conjugate. So G prime h g prime to the minus one and all these conjugates intersect only in the identity element. So here we have elements fixing one point. Um, the identity element of course fixes all points and all the remaining elements that are not um, in, the, in any of the conjugates of h and not the identity must fix no points. So this is a sort of rough picture of what a typical Frobenius group looks like. For example if we look at S3 we get exactly this structure. So we have a subgroup H consisting of say the identity and the element 1, 2 and we have three conjugates of H containing the other three transpositions. And then we have two further elements of G, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2, which fix no points at all. And now we come to Frobenius's theorem, which says that the, the set of points fixing 
zero points together with the identity is a subgroup. That's kind of a bit surprising because there seems to be no obvious reason why if you multiply two elements fixing no points that should either be the identity or something else fixing no points. So in other words you can think of this subgroup as being everything not in one of these subgroups H together with the identity element and, and this will be um, a subgroup K called the Frobenius kernel and it's often denoted by K so let's call this subgroup K the Frobenius kernel. Notice that if it's a subgroup it's automatically a normal subgroup because it's kind of obvious that the union of all conjugates of H is closed under conjugation so the complement is also closed under conjugation. So um, um, th this is an example of a, 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 of a result that's fairly easy to prove using representation theory and very difficult to prove without using representation theory. So the idea of the proof is to use induced representations to turn representations of H into representations of G. And we will construct enough representations of G to show that the, the set K is actually the kernel of all these representations we construct and is therefore a, a, a subgroup, in fact, a normal subgroup. Um, so what we're going to do is recall that if we have a subgroup H of a group G, then if we have a representation of H, we have an induced representation of G. So we, we, we just write in for the induced representation. Sometimes people write in from H to G, but I'm feeling lazy, so I'll, I'll just call it the induced representation. Conversely, if we've got a representation W of G, we can restrict it to H. So we have a restricted representation, the restriction of W. And these two operations, as I mentioned in the last lecture, are sort of a joint. Um, so what does this mean? Well, um, if we translate this into, into the language of characters, um, it means that if we've got an induced character, chi, and we take the inner product with the character psi, then this is equal to the inner product of chi with the restriction of psi. So here, psi and the induced character of chi are representations of G and um, these two are representations of H and this inner product is just the usual inner product of characters. Um, incidentally you can see that here the operations end and restriction on characters look just like a joint linear operations on a vector space. Um, so this, this is one of the reasons why um, the, the term a joint functor is used, that a joint functors really are rather closely related to a joint linear maps. Um, so let's start by taking uh, chi to be the character of an irreducible representation of H and we're going to take this irreducible representation not equal to the trivial representation one. And we're going to look at the induced character of chi. Um, now if we draw a picture of G to see what's going on, you remember we have this subgroup H and um, the chi is some sort of function on, on the subgroup H. And in order to form the induced character, you remember we just sort of take all conjugates of H and conjugate chi onto these. So we also have chi on all the various conjugates of H. So the induced character of G more or less looks like taking the values of chi and just sort of spreading them out over all conjugates of H. Um, the slight exception is the identity element where we have to do something rather more complicated because the identity element occurs in all the conjugates of H. Well it's a bit annoying having to deal with the identity element so instead of inducing chi let's induce chi minus d times the identity character of H. 
where d is the dimension of chi. Um, now this is a bit better because this character here is naught on the identity element of g. So uh, here I'm using one for the trivial character and for the identity element of a group just to confuse everybody. So if we induce this, um, it looks like this. What we do is we take all the conjugates of h and on most of the conjugates of h the character looks like chi minus d or the conjugate of chi minus d and it's zero here and it's also zero on the identity element. So, so we have very good control over over this induced character here. And we can translate this into working out things like the inner product of chi minus 1 dot, sorry, d dot 1h. So we want to work out the inner product of this with itself. And that's easy because it's just the, in, um, it, 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 it's, it's just the restriction of this induced character, chi minus d dot 1. With, and we take the inner product of that with chi minus d dot 1h. And here we're taking the inner product on h and here we're taking the inner product on g. And we can easily work out what this is because this is just equal to chi minus d dot 1 on h. That's because all the conjugates of h are disjoint from h except that they overlap at the identity element. So this is just equal to chi minus d dot 1 chi minus d dot 1 worked out on h and this is equal to 1 plus d squared because chi is not equal to the identity character. Um, on the other hand we can also work out end of chi minus d dot 1 h. We can also work out the inner product of this with the identity character of g and again we can use the adjunction formula and find this is chi minus d dot 1 h and then we have to restrict this to h, which is just the identity character of h. So this is just minus d. So if we look at this character here, um, it contains minus d copies of the identity character, and its norm is d squared plus 1. So um, the d squared is accounted for by the d copies of the identity character, so the leftover one means that, that there must be exactly one other irreducible character in this. In other words, the induced character of chi minus d dot 1h is equal to d times 1g plus some character psi where this is irreducible. So we've got a funny way of going from irreducible characters of h to irreducible characters of d. Where G. We're not quite inducing it. We're first construct we're first subtracting several copies of the identity representation, then we're inducing that, then we're adding back some copies of the identity representation, this time of G, of G. And if we do that, we we end up with an irreducible character. Sorry, that should be a minus there, of course. Um, and we can also work out what the character psi is. So psi looks like this. Well, on the um, group G, um, let's look at the subgroup H. So if we take the character Psi, it will be the same as chi on, on, on the subgroup H, or rather the same as conjugates of chi. And it will even be the same as chi on the identity element because we did this trick of subtracting the I the trivial character and then adding back a trivial character. Meanwhile on the rest of g um, psi is just equal to d. Um, so what you notice is that first of all the kernel of psi contains k because um, anything and any element such that the character value is the same as the identity element must be in the kernel of of, of the character. And secondly, we notice that, 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 that psi is equal to chi on h. Um, uh, now, um, this means that k is equal to the intersection of the kernels of all um, the characters 
Psi. That's, that's because the characters Psi run through all characters of H other than the identity character. So their common kernel is just the, is, is, um, doesn't contain anything in H, but it does contain absolutely anything in K. So this implies K is a normal subgroup. Um, so, uh, as an example, we can just see what happens for the symmetric group, S3. So let's just take G to be S3 and H to be 1, 1, 2 and see how this works out. So here's a picture of S3. We've got 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2 as the two elements that are going to be K. And here we've got the subgroup H, which contains 1 and 1, 2, and we've got its conjugate, so this contains 2, 3, and this contains 3, 1. So, so these are the three conjugates of H. And now we're going to take um, a character chi of H, which is non-trivial. Well, there's only one non-trivial character, so it's going to be 1 on the identity and minus 1 here. So its values look like this. It's going to be 1 here and minus 1 here. Now, if we induce it as we did last lecture, its value is 3 on here and minus 1 on these three points. But that's not what we want to do. We first take chi minus d dot the 1 times the trivial character of h. Well, d is just equal to 1, of course. So this has values 0, minus 2. So, um, so this character now looks like this. So here are the three conjugates of H, and um, let, 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 let's write this character in pink. So this is minus 2 here, and it's 0 here. And now let's induce it up to the whole of G. Well, if we induce it up to G, we just get 0 there, and we get minus 2 here and minus 2 there. And um, we just get 0 at the identity element again. Um, so, so, so this is... What happens if you induce chi minus um, d times 1h? And um, now uh, we're going to add back the identity character of g. And if we do that, what we get looks like this. So here are the three conjugates of h. And now we're going to take this character, um, where we take the induced character of chi minus d dot 1 h and we're going to add d times the um, identity character of g. Sorry, that should be the identity character, trivial character of h. And if we do that, all we're doing is we're adding 1 to everything there. So we get 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 1. And if we recall what the character table of S3 looks like, you remember it looks like this, 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 1, 2, 0, minus 1. So our character is now this character here. And you see in this particular case, this character is a representation whose kernel is exactly the subgroup K consisting of the identity and the elements that don't fix anything. So... Um, that proves Frobenius' theorem that the um, elements that don't fix anything together with the identity in a Frobenius group form a normal subgroup. Um, there's quite a lot more known about this normal subgroup. There's a rather difficult theorem by John Thompson, I think it was actually his PhD thesis, which says that the um, Frobenius kernel of a Frobenius group is always a nilpotent group. Um, and there's quite a lot known about the subgroup H fixing a point as well. It's uh, you can more or less describe all such groups. Okay, that's all about Frobenius groups.